Okay, welcome everybody to the Entrepreneurial Hairstylist Summit. I'm so excited for you to be here and I'm even more excited for our guest expert today. Today we have our expert Cash Lawless. Cash started as a homeless dropout, sweeping hair in a salon for as an assistant for $6 an hour, which if you can even imagine that. From those humble beginnings, Cash has created a massive success for himself working as a celebrity hairstylist, doing hair for people like Justin Bieber, Kylie Jenner, Mandy Moore, Juliana Rancic, Sienna Miller, just to name a few. His work has been featured in Vogue, In Style, L, Harper's Bazaar, Marie Claire, Vanity Fair, Cosmopolitan, Allure, Glamour, and O, oh, the Oprah magazine. But even beyond that, what's super impressive to me is the fact that you've been able to take the money you were earning as a celebrity hairstylist in the guidance from many amazing mentors around you to build multiple multi-million dollar businesses across several different industries and create multiple streams of revenue from business to real estate investing to become a multimillionaire that no longer has to exchange your time for money unless you choose to do so. And now is on a mission to eradicate hairdresser poverty through sharing everything he's learned through his career in his newest venture, The Millionaire Hairstylist. And as if that was not enough, um, most importantly, and I'm sure is probably your most important role that you play is a loving husband and a family man. Did I miss anything? No, you nailed the most important role for me. Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Well, I discovered you um, from listening to the Millionaire Hairstylist podcast, and I wish I had all the time in the world because I love your story and I love just the story of being homeless to getting to live the life that you live and the experiences that you have had and the most amazing people that you've gotten to work with. And a lot of people can look at that and think, wow, like that could never happen for me. But your story is actually comes from very humble beginnings. And I wanted to direct people to that podcast episode because I think it captures so much. And with the short time I have with you today, I want to just extract as much good stuff as we can. So episode nine it, of um, the Millionaire Hairstylist podcast, you guys go back and listen to that one. Um, it has more about Cash's story, how he got to where he got, how that, that story went. And I feel like there's probably even so much more that you guys left out of that podcast episode, but it's very, very good. And I would highly recommend that. But one thing that really um, spoke to me and it jumped out to me that you mentioned was this story of this sticky note. And so do you mind sharing the story of the sticky note and what you wrote down? Yeah. So the, the sticky note was a commitment and um, I had not been a very committed person up until up to that point. And the results in my life really showed that I, you know, I wasn't sleeping on my, my friend's couch, kind of homeless. I was smelled like piss, washing my clothes in a 24 hour gym at two in the morning, uh, homeless. And, um, and my decision-making or my, la my lack of ability to make good choices is what landed me there. And um, there was a family that took me in, rescued me and um, put a roof over my head, gave me clothes, told me I was gonna get a job, read books, really set me on a good path. And um, uh, the, the first job I got was, you know, working minimum wage uh, at a salon one day a week, six bucks an hour. And um, I knew that uh, I never wanted to go back there again. And that was a huge driving force for me to move forward. But uh, you can want something really bad in life, yet not know what decision to make or where to go or what road to choose. And so um, I decided that it didn't matter that as long as I was committed to some path and some vision, as hard as I possibly could be, that that would be better than just wandering and waiting for some great thing to show up for me, uh, some vision of what would be my perfect career or perfect life. Um, and so I saw these hairdressers, they were happy. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to commit to, to something. And so I write down on a sticky note in the salon. Um, I'm going to commit myself um, every waking hour of the day for five years to hairdressing. 
and I will have no option to quit. There is no backing out. There's no nothing. I don't care how broke I am or how much this sucks or, or how great it is. I will not quit. I'll give my five, myself five years. And in five years, only then will I even, it, it will even enter my mind to reassess a career path. Uh, and the two, the two things I said on that note, I still have it. It said, um, uh, you're going to commit yourself to this wholly for five years and you cannot quit um, until those five years have passed. And if at the end of five years, you are um, not making $100,000 a year or more, or not really loving what you, you're doing, only then can you reconsider this path. Um, and so then I just started uh, 16 hours a day uh, doing everything I possibly could to learn everything I could. And that uh, really set me up for a powerful mindset of commitment when I'm in a salon washing a plastic head for the thousandth time, wondering what the hell I'm doing with my life. Um, and, uh, that commitment carried me through that season. And it's a tool I still use to this day, uh, you know, like millionaire hairstylist, uh, we just had our one year anniversary. Yeah. Um, I saw that. But, yeah. So we're, we're, we're still going, um, there's no money. There's, there's, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, and, and so when I'm committed to something, um, it means I'm committed the same as in my marriage. Um, it's the exact same thing. I'm in a hundred percent, um, and give everything I can. And that, that mindset set me up to keep going no matter what, because to, what I found over the years is successful people, um, they, uh, they have, they do two things, uh, prior to success. They kind of all have this thing. They, they, um, they knew what they wanted. So they determined I'm going here, right? They just picked a path, whether they knew it was right or not, doesn't matter. Um, and they kept going. That's it. Like the successful people we see today are just people who did those two things. They got started and they kept going. And those were big lessons that, that I took from that first sticky note into everything I've done. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. I don't know why that, that just was impactful for me, but I think because of the intention and because of the commitment too. um, a couple of things I heard you say, just that you didn't know what you wanted. You didn't even, I mean, you could have never predicted the kind of um, experiences that you would have and opportunities that you would have. You just knew that you needed to go somewhere and do something and commit to something. And so I love that you gave yourself this specific amount of time, um, which is like so huge, right? Like this, how specific you were five years, you gave yourself five years and you committed to going all in. Um, I just think that, you know, as you mentioned, you've gotten to work with some really amazing people and, and you're so right. Like success really starts with a mindset. And even as a young person, you know, starting in your career, like, you know, the fact that you were able to sort of take that step and take that action, um, is so admirable. So my question for you around that is where, I mean, was mindset. So now I feel like you, we hear about mindset all the time and having a positive mindset and setting intention, but back then were you into like mindset or anything like that? Or was that just something you decided, you know what, I'm doing this, I'm going to write this down. Yeah. I mean, once you've experienced, um, the lowest of low, you, you develop a mindset. And sometimes that mindset is really unhealthy. Um, and you conclude things about the world and how it works. And, um, and those conclusions are either going to be lies or they're going to be truth. And so I was fortunate enough to have a good uh, family around me that was helping me um, see things differently. This group of hairdressers as well was what they were happy. They were, they loved what they did. They were energized by their clients. Um, they seemed to make good money and have good lifestyles. And so that was also like, you know, not everyone I was thinking, I used to think like everyone sucks. Everything sucks. Uh, yeah. I suffered from depression back then. And, um, and I just had this, this really, really unhealthy mindset about how the world works and how it has to be. Um, and then I, I met a group of people that proved me totally wrong. And I had to just wake up to reality and say, Hey, there's, there's a different path here. Um, in that I will say, um, I did start waking up to the power of mindset more intentionally after reading a book in this same time period called think and grow rich, um, which that, uh, when, when I was set the goal on the sticky, no, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew what can I do uh, that's different than what I have been doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Um, and that, that's where that commitment came from and, and having that mindset, but I didn't really um, understand on the forefront of the mind, like, you know, uh, cognitively or, or with an awareness that mindset is the foundation of all things that, that our, our future could represent. You know, if you, if you start out down the path of the bad mindset, every step you take is less than what you could be. And you, but you're, if you believe wrong things, you will make wrong choices like I did. And you'll end up in wrong places and you'll end up ultimately miserable when we believe lies about life. So it was really important for, uh, for me um, in the, when developing the Millionaire Hairstylist, we came up with the three most important pillars that I felt all of my successful clients embraced. I found to be true in, in the pursuit of, of achieving what you want. Um, and that all started with a foundation of the way these people thought and the way these people think. And so at the Millionaire Hairstylist, we, we focus on that first because nothing you do or attempt with will work as well as you'd like it to with a bad mindset. So true. So true. You can't out strategize a bad mindset, right? Yeah, very true. Yeah. It's true. So um, I'm going to fast forward again. Definitely everybody go back and listen to the podcast episode because it has all the golden stuff, all the goodies. But I want to fast forward a little bit because it worked out for you, right? This five year plan that you had ended up working out for you. Um, and you share all about that, but what you shared a lot throughout that podcast episode was the importance of mentors in your life. And so you've had some really amazing mentors like John Paul DeGiorgio and Wynn Claybaugh and people like that. And so that played a huge role in just your success in connection, in your mindset and just all of the things. So um, how important has mentorship been to you throughout your career? And then also, what would you recommend to a hairstylist or salon owner that has been hearing about people having mentors, but just doesn't have that person? How would they go about finding a good mentor? Yeah, that's a good question. And actually, I get asked this quite a bit because I do say mentors are so powerful. So the first thing is like, well, how do I get one? Right. Yeah. Um, and so I say two things about getting mentors. Um, first, what, what is a mentor? A mentor is a person who is a naturally developed relationship where uh, the mentor derives value in uh, investing in you. Most successful people are investors of their time. They have to be very careful with how they give that time. So the number one way to attract a good mentor is to be a high ROI person. When a mentor tells me to do something, I do it immediately and I do it 10x. Um, and so they see that their words don't fall on deaf ears. They're not wasting their time or their breath. They're, I respect their time. Um, and when, they, when I ask them a question, it's very short, very pointed at, at, at what they are an expert in. Um, and so developing those relationships, I think they started as acquaintances. All of them had to meet someone originally. Um, but the way that I did it was uh, for Gwen Claybog, for example, um, I wanted to get better at public speaking. I'm still a terrible public speaker who has lots of rooms to improve. And I will, I will get better. Um, but uh, I said, you know, oh, gosh, I want to, I want to be more like you and where you're at in life. And, um, and I'd just love to ask you one question, you know, about that. And uh, I would love to get your email address. And I sent him a very short email um, about uh, playing the piano. And, and a hobby that we had both said like, oh, I, I love playing the piano. You love playing the piano. Well, it had nothing to do with business or being like him. And um, we just chatted about a passion, a mutual passion for, for a couple of emails and uh, just thought like, what, why'd you get into it? Why, why do you love it? Why are you a musician? You know, um, just chatting personally. Mm -hmm. Over time, it just turned into a normal relationship. Um, and I love him today. And that's how a lot of my relationships start is just a genuine curiosity about who people are. Yeah. Um, how they operate, how they think, and just them personally. I, I, I don't walk up to people and be like, hey, I'd love to send you an email about a business opportunity. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's definitely not how to do it. But if you're not, if you're not in, a, in, a, um, in an opportunity, by the way, to meet when I, I heard he was coming to the state that I was in and I, I had no gas money and I had no car, I had to borrow a friend's car to go drive down uh, to see him. And um, most, most people just, you know, they wouldn't, go and drive for the chance to meet somebody. A lot of people wouldn't. Um, they'd kind of wait for them to come to them. And so I, I was pretty proactive in gaining mentors because the people in the books I was reading were really powerful in my life. So that's being a person of high ROI just means being really, really fast to take action on the advice um, of your mentors. When they say, try something or do something, 
try it. it you are not them. If they are speaking from years of experience uh, and, and a long track record of success in a certain area of life, um, try it. Take, take their advice, go do it. It may not work for you, but you are respecting their, uh, their time and their experience and their, their knowledge when you do that. And then you give them a report and like, wow, here's what I found. So that's one thing. If you don't have access to mentors, there is another way to get mentorship and that's coaching. And I don't feel like um, uh, you have to have a natural relationship with a mentor to progress. If that mentor is not there, don't wait. Take action to go meet new people. That's super important. But while you're looking for that relationship, um, go pay someone for advice. I, I think that's, that's really important. Fun. Yeah, um, There are people out there who have the shortcuts and the models. They already work. They know what works. Go buy the information. Just, mm -hmm. just You will save yourself years of headache. If you ever question like, hmm, should I take this course? Or hmm, should I uh, do this online program? Or oh, sh it's $500. Oh, people think they're investing in themselves and they spend $500. You're not. You can spend way, way more. Um, so uh, I, I feel like that those are, the, those are the two things that I would recommend for mentorship is be a person of high ROI. And if you don't have a mentor in your life right now, go buy one. Yeah. That's amazing advice. Oh, I love it. I love um, the ROI. That's that's awesome. That's a really great like. Um, that's a really great tip for anybody. And then also too, you mentioned like put people first, right? You you said that you were like looking for the relationship. Create. It's not like you were out on a mission to find somebody that could just do something for you. You were in creating relationships and that's really how it starts. Those genuine um, relationships and, and people want to help. You know, I mean, some of my best mentors like are super successful and, and they want to help, you know, and, and it's, but you have to invest in those relationships for sure. And then absolutely save yourself the time, energy, and just buy the information. There's so much good information out there now, way more than whenever I first started doing hair, probably when you did too, like so oh much. My gosh. Yes. There was cat videos on YouTube and yes. <laughs> When I started, there was absolutely nothing. There weren't any coaches or trainings or anything. And so for everyone who's who's listening to this, you're you're already on the right path. You're already taking action to educate yourself and take part in things where if I take if I take a class, I know people that are that are like, they'll take a five hour class. They'll take the same one I took and they'll go, oh, wait, hey, I, I recommend it. What do you think? Oh, I, don't know, I didn't really get anything. Or it's like, dude, I, if I pay for something, I am going to get something. I don't care how bad that class is. I will make, I will find at least one thing valuable that I can leverage to my advantage out of any educational, uh, you know, opportunity I've ever taken. And I, and I do them a lot. Yeah. I've spent over a hundred thousand dollars on classes. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. And, and cash, is that something that you still do? Yeah. Oh, I'm in a $20,000 class right now. It's amazing. That's yeah. awesome. I love it. I actually, when I when I knew that there was a, a little bit of a gap in my financial knowledge, I went and found the best person I could in the world, and I paid him twenty thousand dollars to teach me what it does. It's amazing. So it doesn't ever stop, you guys. Like no. this is, I mean, it doesn't ever stop. Like successful people are, are still have mentors, still invest in themselves, still, you know, it, it even, I mean, on a uh, on a much bigger scale. So it doesn't ever stop, you guys. Um, so you mentioned too, and this was a small risk that you took, which was getting in a car when you had no gas money and going to see Win Clay Boss speak. Yeah. And so there's risks involved with success anytime, you know, opening a business, building a clientele, um, making your first investment outside of the salt, whatever it might be, there's always risk involved. So can you share maybe something, one of the biggest risks that you have taken in your career that has had the biggest payoff? Uh, my education. That, that is the biggest risk because you have no idea what you're going to get. You have no idea if you're going to be able to use it. You have no idea if it's going to make you money or have a return. Um, the only way that education has a return is if you are the person that puts your education to work. Um, knowledge is not power. It is not at all. I mean, you can have an encyclopedia sitting on a shelf and it's not very powerful. You got to put it to work. And so if you're, if you are the type of person that puts knowledge to work, then education will be the highest risk decision you make. And if you, if you're going to invest in it big, 
um, because there is no, like when you, when you do a haircut, you're taking a risk, but there's a hundred bucks on the other side of it. You know what I mean? It's like, you're, you're probably yeah. going to get paid. Yeah. Um, you know, when you, when you go to hair school, there's a little bit of a bigger risk. It's a bigger, bigger amount of money. Um, and maybe you'll, you know, you're not sure you can be able to build a clientele well, but most, most people that get out of school, they, they make some money from it. There's some return. Um, additional education, uh, on top of that is like, gosh, I take a class. I, I hope I learn a technique or I hope I gain some knowledge or there, there is, there is no guarantee on the other side that that will turn into anything for you unless you decide that you are going to make that information valuable. Uh, and so I do think that the amount of money and time and years and effort uh, I've spent investing in my education, it's probably the highest risk because most of the other stuff, um, I mean, I'm, I'm spending gobs of money starting up a new company right now. I'm developing an app right now. Um, and this app is competing against some of the biggest apps in the world. And so um, it's a huge thing to take on. It's a huge risk, but I still think eh, it's, a, it's an asset. I'll probably be able to recoup. I, very, I approach these things in a very uh, mathematical way. And, um, but the future is completely unknown, but it's never more unknown than, hmm. What am I going to learn here? <laughs> I mean, yes. You don't know what the product is until you take it, right? So yeah. I, I just think education is the biggest risk, but it also has the biggest payoff. There is no bigger payoff in my life than the education I've got. One, I made, uh, I spent probably a total of ten thousand dollars on hair school in the beginning, and that probably that, that made me millions in my career. Um, so yeah, huge ROI there. Um, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars more on extended education, even in, in hair, outside of hair. Um, and, uh, and those have all paid off in millions fold. So yeah. there is a risk. You don't know what you're going to get, but I think it's also the, the wisest risk you can take. And I will say if you're, if you're timid or you're shy, or you're scared to take a risk. The one thing that really, really helps with that is competence. So I always say you work to learn before you work to earn. You want to get your education straight before you take big risks, right? The only thing that makes something risky is the unknown. And I tell, I tell people this a lot too. If you're sitting at a poker table and you knew everyone's hand, would you have any risk in your play? No, you know whether you'd use, whether you win, whether you should play. Right. The whole thing with poker is you don't know what everyone else has. So there's risk. It is the unknown that brings on risk. But with increased knowledge comes decreased risk. So the more you invest in your education and the more you invest in gaining knowledge, the less risky these things will feel because you'll start to see a path. You'll start to see forward. You'll start to see how it's possible because you understand how it's done. And that, um, that's a really, really, uh, really good way if you're scared to take a risk uh, or you're nervous about something, go passionately pursue your education in that arena and take some baby steps. One step forward, like buy a book then buy a course, then go learn from somebody, go hire a coach, take, take, take small steps at a time. And, and if that's, you know, everybody's personality is different when it comes to risk. Yeah. Um, just make sure you're not letting fear um, dictate what's going to actually uh, occur in your life. Fear is, is, uh, is very different than analyzing risk. So yeah, yeah just uh, increase knowledge, decrease risk, learn more, learn as much yeah. as you can. That's a, that's an awesome perspective for sure. Um, I actually never really thought about that, like education that way, but yeah, like the more competence that you have, it is, it's like just the more confident you'll be too in making those decisions and, and whatever direction that you're going. So I love that. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about money and like the mindset and things like that. So, um, what do you think for hairstylists and salon owners right now in our industry, because I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that, I mean, I, I don't want to assume why you started mul uh, the million dollar hairstylist, like, um, but traditionally we, I, I think even just the name of that is so powerful because I don't think hairstylists and salon owners ever think that that is a possibility for them. Yeah. Right to be a million. I mean, it's, it's bold to say, and, and I think it's beautiful because you have seen, you've experienced it. You've seen it time and time again, and you have put a lot of work into this concept that you guys have, and you are seeing it happen more and more for hairstylists to become millionaires. And so I know we talked a little bit about mindset and I know this is a pillar of yours, but what do you think right now in our industry what is the most impactful mindset shift 
that you see hairstylists need to make in the industry right now to create wealth for themselves? Hmm. Most impactful mindset shift. I would probably say what we just talked about, which would be um, confidence. The, the this is there's a strange um, correlation out there. There's there's a soup of success, and there's a lot of ingredients in that soup, and lots of people have different ingredients of that soup, and so they kind of make their own soup, and that works for them and these other people, but they have some key ingredients. Each, each bowl of soup has key ingredients. Someone else might have a little extra pepper or whatever. Yeah. But I would say the primary ingredient, um, and I've known a lot of successful people, a lot. I've worked with some of the world's richest people and most famous people. Um, and I've gotten to sit on private jets with these people and have chats and I've basically lived life with these people. And, um, and I just noticed a lot about the, the commonality in that soup. The pandemic in our industry is a lack of confidence. I think people in our industry, hairdressers as a whole, think they're worse than they are. That there's this total lack of confidence. And I know this because I experienced it myself and I saw, I saw my timidity and fear in the beginning of my career as I, I wanted to make everything perfect and I really wanted to please my clients. And, I, and, I, and in the beginning, when I didn't have that competence, um, I really lacked the confidence and people smelled that on me. And um, in the celebrity world, you get eaten alive when people smell fear on you. Yeah. Um, they know exactly where you are in the social chain. So um, it took time for me to understand, um, hey, I noticed that all these, all these successful people, are they, they know what they want. They know where they're going. They know what they want to do. They have a plan for how to get there. And they walk and talk and, and just eat, sleep, and breathe this confidence and power. I'm not saying they don't feel insecurities like all of us do. But they do have um, they do have a different walk and talk about them, and I wanted to absorb that. I really wanted to absorb when I when I walk somewhere. Um, I wanted to communicate with everything I was, the way I talk, the way I look at somebody, the way that I enter a room, my posture. That it all communicated that I was confident. I knew what I was doing, and you should trust me. I'm, I'm a great decision maker, and when it comes to your hair, when I say something, you should listen to me. I know what I'm doing. I have a lot of experience. I have years and a portfolio to back it up. And when you communicate that with uh, your, your body language and um, uh, the way you speak, it's crazy how what, it, what, turned, what changed for me um, in, in the industry. It used to be that people would sit in my chair in the beginning of career as a new client and kind of question whether I was going to be good or not because they had no idea who I was or what I did. Right. And they kind of expected me to mess up. But as soon as I established authority through credibility, um, that all changed. They wanted me to wave a wand. They thought that I, I had some magical power to make them look like, you know, uh, Kim Kardashian or something. Right. <laughs> the expectation rose way high, so I had to start to curb that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but what what really changed was when things started to turn around for me was when I gained the confidence to take big risks and anything that walked in that door, I, I looked at and, and became no longer fearful of anything. Like anything could come through that door. You get the most jacked up hair, whatever it is, I will solve it. I know I can do it. That kind of attitude, that, 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 that internal conversation instead of anxiety, you know, um, I started to shift from anxiety to that. Mm -hmm. And it, it completely changed my career path. And the reason I tell that story is because that confidence really was part of a soup that allowed me to succeed in everything else I've done as well. I've had plenty of failures, so failures. I don't mean I succeeded at everything, but the things that I have succeeded in, mm -hmm. um, I, I took that part of that soup, that ingredient, and carried it over into everything I did, and I saw that I was bolder. I took more risks, and so I got bigger rewards. I got much bigger rewards. And when I started going to set and hairstylists started asking me, you know, I was, hey, oh my gosh, I'm flipping houses like on my phone. You, you, you experienced a little bit of my life today. Yes, <laughs> I yeah. yeah. I, I don't know how many times we've rescheduled this or pushed this, but um, yeah. I'm literally traveling the world, flipping houses remote, um, investing in real estate, um, investing in other things, lending money and, uh, and doing this remote. And, and when I started telling people, oh, I'm flipping houses, oh, how many have you done? I started hitting 100, 200 houses. And people started getting very curious as to what, what the heck I was doing, how I was doing this, and how I was so confident that I could buy houses from a phone 
you know, fly, flying across the country, trust these teams, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a project and hope that while I'm gone, it all works out, right? right. Um, and so people were very curious about that and it really did come down to, I, I was really confident um, in, in my ability to solve whatever problem landed in my lap. Yeah. And if we can solve that through competence, which is which we do what we talked about. Incre when you increase your competence, it increases confidence. My gosh, hairdressers are unstoppable because we are we really are so uniquely positioned beyond what most hairdressers understand for huge success, both both in in reputation and in your finances. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's awesome. Um, and I think you're so right. I, I don't know. I, I guess it just sort of hit home for me because that's, you know, it's something that I've struggled with confidence. And I know so many people that follow me and clients of mine, that's something that comes up all the time in our industry. And I don't know if it's just that we're just heart centered people who we love people so much that like, I don't know, I don't know what that is, but I know that you'll be talking a lot about that in the millionaire hairstylist. So um, I know that I'll be signing up for it and I don't even <laughs> hair behind the chair anymore, but I'm just like so attracted to the education that you're putting out there. And so you mentioned it just briefly right there. You said hairstylists are uniquely positioned for financial success. Can you explain to us why hairstylists are positioned for financial success? Yeah. First, I want to warn everybody um, that this can, it can, some of the words I might use or terminology might be really boring or financially, uh, but don't worry. I will, I will make it make sense um, and just stick with it. Um, typically, I want, to, I want to just start on this topic and then I'll, I'll answer that question in just a second. Um, we hairstylists believe a myth, a huge myth that because we're great artists and we're caring people um, and we love to serve people, we can't really be good with money. And so we should probably pay someone else to do that. Um, we, we believe we say things to ourselves like, um, uh, God, how, how am I going to afford that? Or gosh, money's just a, it's a necessary evil. It's so overwhelming. It's, it's uh, stressful, you know, <laughs> money can be all of these things. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when we believe something like this, like we talked about, when we have improper mindsets, we make bad choices. Mm -hmm. And what, what I've found has really occurred is that um, I was horrible with money. Um, I was about as bad as you could get. I had zero dollars, you know, and lots of debt <laughs> and homeless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so I know that I've been really bad with money. And I know that I got really good with money. And the only difference was that money has nothing to do whether you're an artist or a good business person. It has to do with everything about uh, your mindset, about what you can and can't do. Um, money is a language. And just like you weren't born uh, speaking Mandarin, probably, you know, or, or if, you're, if you're born speaking Mandarin, just like you weren't born speaking English, maybe. Um, you weren't born speaking the language of hair. And you weren't born speaking the language of money. And both have a language. And that language can be learned and leveraged just like any other vocabulary in the world. And um, when we hairstylists understand that language, because we are creative, we open up and unlock some really powerful creative doors, which we're starting to see a lot of hairstylists do. Now, I'll answer your question. Why are hairstylists so uniquely uh, positioned for massive financial success? Well, it's because um, for the last forever, hairdressing is one of the oldest careers, they say, thousands and thousands of years old. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, hairdressing has been a cash flow based business. A cash flow based business means you do a service and the business rests on cash consistently coming in the door from the services being provided. And you focus on continuing to bring cash in the door, which is every, every business wants cash can, to continue coming in the door. But the difference nowadays is how cash comes through the door and um, whether the hairstylist needs to be doing a service for cash to be coming in that door. The way big businesses are built and the, and the way big dollar businesses are built are they are asset based businesses. So you think about an app, right? It's a technology. Uh, it requires 80% of the money spent on apps is spent on developers. It's not on cost of goods sold or, you know, like re, uh, uh, inventory and things like that. It's a different type of business. Most of their money goes to the development of the product, but the product, everyone can go to sleep that night and the app can still make money, right? Everyone in the company goes to sleep, app still makes money. Every hairdresser goes to sleep, they're not making money. That's different now. That's changing for hairdressers because 
hairdressing is becoming an asset-based business through digital assets. Um, hairdressers now can build physical assets like product lines. Like think of a fireman, does he have a career? What are his chances of building a product line? I mean, he can sell axes or something, I don't know. Yeah. Um, right. it's, 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 it's much harder for him. How can a fireman establish authority? Right? There's nothing wrong with being a fireman, but I'm just giving you an example of other careers out there. Um, a lawyer, can he develop a product line? Um, can he uh, you know, build a, a personal brand of an established authority as easily as a hairstylist can? Hairstylists have millions of followers. They have massive audiences that brands in the past have paid millions of dollars to acquire those eyeballs. Now hairdressers, they're getting them you know, for free just by being amazing at what they do. That following is a digital asset. It's an asset of people, people's eyeballs and their attention, that attention is an asset and you can make money on that asset through sponsorships, for example. Um, you can make digital assets like online courses or sponsored content or YouTube videos that create uh, passive income generation through ads. The, the, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I can name, I've named like probably like eight or, or so different ways mm -hmm. that a hairdresser be, can become an asset-based business. But when a hairdresser has an audience which a hairdresser has to have really to be a, a successful hairdresser. You have to build an audience, uh, at least a clientele. Mm -hmm. um, they have a platform to develop anything they want and sell that to a, a, a large enough audience to where the, the, it becomes an asset that produces income in their sleep. And that's what, that's what we kind of talk about in the millionaire hairstylist is most of the millionaires I know in hairdressing, they don't have to do hair anymore. They, their, their cash flow from the, the assets producing that cash flow has far exceeded the, the money that they charge behind the chair. When you do hair, you are in a commodity-based business, which a commodity is something that's sold at a market price. So a market price, meaning coffee, for example, would you pay a million dollars for a bag of coffee? No, there's a standard price we all pay for coffee. It fluctuates a little bit, right? Yeah, maybe someone pays $20 a bag, maybe someone pays five. And the same thing is with a haircut. In a certain market like New York, the commodity might hit a high price of $1,000. And in a commodity like... Um, a smaller town somewhere, Albuquerque, New Mexico, for example, that might be $150 as, a, as an expensive haircut in the market mind. We have a limit to the amount that we can make if in our market, the commodity cap is $150. How many hours can you really work um, and pay taxes on that $150, losing you know, 37 to 52% of your income to taxes? What's your max income? So hairdressers, they can dream big, but th there is a limit to what can be done behind the chair. And what I've discovered is that standing behind the chair is a tool um, that goes well beyond just the service you're doing. It goes well beyond that because I can be standing behind a chair and be making $2,000 on a service. I can be making $8,000 by filming it and mentioning the products from a brand sponsorship. I can then put that on YouTube and then make passive income from the ad, ad income on top of that. And now I have a triple layered service that just may be more than 10 grand with an annuity income on top of it. But um, I think many hairstylists are not kind of yet aware of these opportunities and which ones are for me, right? Because there's so many ways that you can become an asset-based business. But the mind shift from, I do, I get paid, I do, I get paid, to I do once and I get paid forever is a big mind shift. Mm -hmm. um, and many, many hairstylists are taking this on and they're doing insane things. So starting in extension companies, um, they're, you know, making wigs, starting podcasts with sponsored ads in the beginning. I mean, heck, uh, anyone out there who can talk, you can do a podcast, build a following, reach out to some product brands, say, hey, I've got, I've got 10,000 downloads a month, very highly targeted audience for you. You want to pay 2000 bucks a month for ads for me? I'll mention your, you know, 30 second ad in the beginning of my thing. If you want to sponsor my podcast, boom, now you got a podcast playing out there with passive income for you. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing time to be a hairdresser. Uh, and I think we, we just have like the most amazing career because the potential is limitless. I know hairdressers like whose first year in a product line made $20 million. That's just ridiculous. Insane. And they own like eight salons and it's like, those are like, you know, 250 K a month in income. So, yeah. um, it's, it's massive. So if hairdressers can like, I want everybody to wake up to a massive, massive potential. And I don't know how long these opportunities will be around. I have no idea. Maybe there'll be more. Yeah. But, act quickly. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that because I do think you're so right is that this isn't being talked about at all. So mm -hmm. the fact that um, it's a it's a very exciting time in our industry and um, and what you just said is actually going to open up the just 
the, po the, the possibilities. It just shows you what the possibilities are. And, and you're talking about 20 million. I mean, there's some hairstylists that would be happy to be making 60,000, you know, they're making 30,000. They'd be happy to make 60,000. Like, you know, so it just, it, there's so, there's so much opportunity out there. And, um, I just want to thank you so much for, bringing this to the table, bringing this conversation to the table, sharing your experience and your knowledge. Um, I do have one question for you before we finish up. Sure. I'm asking every expert this is if you could only give one piece of advice, just one, one piece of advice to hairstylists and salon owners building their business right now, what would that be? Mm. Gosh, that's a good question. One piece of advice, um, I would say build your confidence at any cost through acquiring competence and education. That's made the biggest difference for me. And whether that education is changing your mindset, focusing on the mindset, hiring a therapist to get through some challenging, really challenging things that may be holding you back you're unaware of. Um, I, I have an emotional coach. Like, I, I just I want to make sure that I'm dealing with a lot of people's money. I, I manage a multi-million dollar portfolio of other people's money too. And I need to know that what I'm, the decisions I'm making are, I'm not making from an emotional position that could really threaten other people's money as well. And so I want to stay up on my game and know that, hey, I'm going through this in life. I need, I need, I want to, I want to uh, make sure that I'm, I'm tip top and thinking about things right. And so, or, or whether it's a skill set competence, you know, either like I'm really, I don't feel competent in haircutting. Maybe, maybe that's it. Um, go spend some coin and be, and, and dedicate yourself to growing in that confidence, build confidence, it, competence, it will grow your confidence. And with confidence, you will be able to take those risks that are necessary for huge rewards. So I think um, answering off the cuff, that's, that's what I would probably say. Yeah, I love it. Well, thank you on behalf of our industry. I just want to say thank you so much for bringing just your experience, your expertise, your insight, your knowledge, everything that you've gotten to experience throughout your career and bringing it to our space, you know, and, and really, I know you mentioned this, um, that you're at a point in your career where you're still doing your thing, right? You're still doing your thing, but you're really at a point where you want to create impact and leave a legacy. And I do believe that this is going to be a legacy for you, for the millionaire hairstylist and for our industry. So thank you so much for following your gut nudge to, um, to create the million, um, the millionaire hairstylist podcast and the course that's coming up. So that, um, leads me to my final thing, which is, I think just, can you share a little bit about where people can get more information and how they can get in connection with you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to the millionairehairstylist.com to sign up to get early access to the course. We won't be launching the course um, to everybody right away. So it, because um, we want to make sure that we are very engaged with every single person who is engaged with us in, 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 that, uh, in that first release. And so um, that you can go to that website, sign up. Um, for, for early access, you'll be notified uh, when that's coming. And then um, you can follow us on, on uh, Instagram at themillionairehairstylist.com. You can also uh, find our podcast played anywhere, any of the streaming services, uh, Spotify, um, iTunes, and, um, and that's The Millionaire Hairstylist on those. Uh, the Millionaire Hairstylist, it, it, goes, it goes well beyond just earning money. We talk about all three phases of building wealth. You will learn exactly how to maximize your earned income, invest in growth assets, and then finally start producing a, a passive six-figure income. Not an earned six-figure income, which you do behind the chair, but it's very possible for hairstylists to be earning six figures in their sleep. And we break down how to do that step-by-step. -step. That's amazing. Well, thank you very much for being here today. I appreciate your time, Cash. Thanks for having me.